Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I oh, okay. need it to I think I could have
So, um, I won't be able to fix it because Albert was supposed to come by okay. and have a solution. So, for today, it'll just be like that. It's okay. And then tomorrow, you should have a solution for that. Yeah. Sounds good. Try it. If you would like to, go for it. Okay. I didn't actually get stressed, so, yeah. you know. Okay. Uh, so, just give me the wave when you're ready to go. What? You're ready to go right now? Oh, yeah, just go for it. Okay, whoops. Hi, everybody. If you can grab your seats, we're going to start our next session. So um, our next speaker is Mike Frank from Stanford University, who's going to be talking about uh, medium data in the world. So Mike. Hey everybody. Uh, so uh, I wasn't here this morning, but uh, hopefully everything has been going well. I'm really excited that everybody is here and folks joining us on the live stream as well. Um, how are people doing? Good. Red posted, blue posted. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, so my goal here today is to tell you about a ecosystem that exists in R that is broadly called the tidyverse. Uh, and the initial author of the tidyverse is a guy named Hadley Wickham, but now there are many contributors to it. And together, uh, for me at least, and I think for the broader internet data analysis community, the tidyverse has really revolutionized the way we do data analysis. In part, that's because of what it actually presents in terms of tools, but in part, that's because of the conceptual foundations, the decomposition of the problem of data analysis. And that's the exciting part. So what I'm going to do in this tutorial is introduce you guys to the tidyverse, and I'm going to try to show you a little bit of how to use it while I overdo the concepts that make it up so that you can then take that conceptual understanding and look up the documentation, which is basically what I do every day, all the time. Um, I'm sure you've already talked about the importance of Stack Overflow, but uh, if you haven't, that's, that's how we do it. Um, so I, I kind of, um, my personal approach to data analysis and to programming more generally comes straight from the uh, software carpentry workshops the metaphor of becoming a carpenter, so you can nail something together if necessary, as opposed to an engineer. We learn from engineers, we build on what engineers do, uh, we take up their awesome tools, uh, and then we nail together bookshelves so that our books aren't on piles on the floor. <laughs> and ideally, we share that code so that we then uh, can build on the bookshelves of other people, which breaks them out. <laughs> so there you go. Um, okay, so you guys uh, are working on remote copies of this tutorial that I've put together. So um, back over in the browser, um, what I would do here is create a new RStudio session. Um, and the RStudio session is going to load up. And uh, I am um, completely clean here, but you guys should have the top level folder cloned up already. So that top level folder contains in it the Frank Tidyverse tutorial. And in there is a Frank Tidy first tutorial, uh, R Markdown file. So go ahead and open that up, and I'm going to switch over to my local copy. The reason I'm using my local copy is I've got some bells and whistles set up in the local copy that I can show you for packages that uh, have dependency conflicts or are doing other things. Um, and so um, you guys are going to be working with cached data, and I'm going to be working with live data and a few extra packages. But you should have all of the main code for this tutorial. Okay. Um, so maybe you can um, blue post it when you've got the uh, R markdown uh, open and are ready to move forward. While you guys are still getting that set up, um, I just want to say that my goal in this tutorial is to uh, translate some of the work that's been done in the tidyverse to the psychological data analysis context. So I'm trying to give you a sense of how I use the tidyverse in my day-to-day -day data analysis practice and how it's changed the way I think about data analysis. The uh, real reference for this stuff, though, is um, Hadley Wickham's R for Data Scientists, which is a great book. It's free online. Um, it has all of this content and more, and it's really a wonderful place to start learning this stuff. But I, I hope to show you why you would want to learn it and uh, how you could plug in even the simplest bits into a basic psychology uh, data analysis workflow. And I'm calling this medium data in the tidyverse because one of the things that happened when I switched from base R and the kind of 
programmatic but more basic ways I was analyzing data over to the tidyverse is that it expanded my reach from small data, uh, data sets that I have typically interact with as an experimental psychologist, like uh, tens or hundreds of kids did dozens of trials, over to something a little bit bigger. Uh, so I started being able to, in the same tool set that I use for the small data, analyze medium-sized data, you know, um, maybe millions or maybe even tens of millions of observations from an online data set. Um, maybe, uh, you know, a corpus of 10 million utterances or something like this. Now, I'm not in the realm of big data. We're not parallelizing massively. We're not bigger than fits in memory. Um, but those million, 10 million row data sets, those are increasingly common. Uh, and it's really nice not to have to move to the like kind of heavy lifting ecosystem in order to get anything out of it. It's really nice just to have uh, it work. And under the kind of basic tool set of uh, base R, it's hard to just have it work there. Things start to slow down, break, it starts to get kind of clunky. Um, the tidyverse, because it's written very nicely uh, and efficiently, it will work on those data sets. It'll work in ingesting them, storing them, and analyzing them relatively speedily. And so you don't have to break your stride as your data get to the medium level. Of course, once you go to uh, bigger and bigger data sets, you're always going to have to make special accommodations. But putting that off as long as possible is really nice. OK, I, I see a lot of blue post-its, so we're ready to get started. So um, the uh, ecosystem we're using here, all of you are familiar with R, um, at least as of you know, two nights ago or something. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the ecosystem we're using here is very similar to the Jupyter notebooks that you have, were using this morning. Um, this is R Markdown. Uh, there are many different reasons to choose between uh, ecosystems. Um, one reason why I'm increasingly using R Markdown in my own lab is because R Markdown can be knit by a, uh, the um, knitter package to a variety of attractive formats. So uh, you can knit it to HTML to make it interactive or um, pretty for the web, but you can also critically knit it to PDF or even Word. Now the details of that aren't important here, but I just want to note going forward that uh, the reason I use this ecosystem is because I actually use it for writing scientific papers in which the code and data are uh, blocks of code like you'll see here, and the text is the kind of text that I write. And I write in a little bit of formatting stuff um, and some bibliographic references, uh, and then it'll actually knit to an APA format manuscript that's reproducible uh, and uh, for which when I update the data, I can actually update the manuscript afterwards. So that's a really exciting thing that I'm not going to talk about today, but it's a plug for that kind of reproducible writing uh, that will really help you integrate your code and data sharing with your writing practice. So, okay. Uh, so this is a, uh, a view of an R Markdown file that's called an R Markdown Notebook. It's literally just R and uh, R Studio trying to copy Jupyter Notebooks, so it's going to look similar. It's still not totally as fully featured, but it's pretty decent. So um, this first chunk just sets up some dependencies. Um, I'll just walk you through what we're using here and why. The major library that we're using is uh, the Tidyverse library. Um, I'm also just going to show you DT for data tables, which is just a way of looking at data easily. Um, I'm going to use GG themes, which is really not that exciting, but it's got some like things to make the plots look pretty. Um, you don't source this library word banker. I'm going to use this for um, getting, used, uh, getting live copies of some data, which you'll use in a cache way. Um, and then um, I'm going to use fur and shiny um, at the very end. But uh, don't, don't worry about those. And we don't need the, the uh, these are for knitting, so they're, they're just options. So kind of a bunch of this stuff is just um, for my use. The primary library that you want is Tidyverse, and then DT and GG themes. Um, yeah, if, if you're ever going to want to knit this, which is debatable, you could comment it out, or you could, um, yeah, yeah, comment it out. Um, so uh, the um, I'm very hotkey oriented here, so uh, uh, on the Apple Shift Command C will comment it, and Option Command C will run the chunk. So if I want to run the chunk, um, which is kind of a nice way to uh, proceed through this chunk-based computation, um, then commenting things out so that it'll run. Okay, um, so this tutorial has four parts, which I hope to get through uh, by 4 p.m. The first part is the conceptual introduction to the idea of tidy data and the way that a particular data format brings you into the tidyverse. 
the universe of things you can do to tidy data. And I'm just going to make the case for this is the way <coughs> you should be structuring your data uh, for small and medium data <coughs> applications. For large data, all bets are off, but for small and medium, it's an awesome format. Then um, I'm going to talk about how to do stuff with tidy data. Um, and that portion of the tutorial is going to be analyzing a psychological data set from my lab. It's a small data set, uh, but it shows off why the uh, tidy data plus tidyverse uh, really changed my data analytic practices in the day-to-day -day of being an experimental psychologist. Next, I'll talk about how to get your data to be tidy. If you don't have tidy data, how do you get to tidy? Um, like getting to yes, only um, more internally rewarding. Um, and uh, then in the end, I'll demo some, uh, some kind of cool stuff you can do uh, about medium data. So uh, we'll use a, an online data set of a large scale group of, uh, of reports of children's vocabulary acquisition, because I'm a developmental psychologist that studies kids' word learning. So we'll get a bunch of data from that, and we'll play with it, and then I'll put it through some kind of cooler paces at the very end using some extra packages. You'll see how with a relatively small amount of work um, and a relatively small amount of code, you can actually make some pretty cool interactive stuff with medium-sized data in this ecosystem. Things that are totally doable in lots of other ecosystems, but if you were to kind of like hand carve them out of JavaScript, it would take you like days rather than 10 lines. So, okay. Uh, so at the very beginning, I'm just going to um, talk about uh, some kind of core concepts. There are a bit of, bit of review here of um, basic stuff about R and data frames. Um, and I'll use the famous IRIS data set that comes with uh, ggplot. So um, OK, raise your hand if you are familiar with data frames, roughly. OK, so data frames, good. Um, data frames are basically, you know, they're the reason, sort of, I was thinking about this roughly 10 years ago that I was talking to R. Data frames are a data analysis specific data type, which uh, are a, a primitive in R and are a really important part of R. But back in the day when we were you know, hand carving our data analysis in MATLAB, there was no such thing as a data frame. Uh, data frame uh, is a, a, um, a set of rows and columns, and each column can have a distinct data type. So that's the revolutionary part. In a matrix, a normal matrix, everything has to be a number. But in a data frame, you can have a column that's called like name of my puppy, and that'll be just fine. Um, so uh, there are a bunch of implementations of this data type. Um, in Python, Pandas has uh, data frames, but most of the comments are the, uh, the concepts are the same. Um, there's the base R data dot frame. Uh, so that's kind of what you get when you load up R. But actually, as you source the tidyverse here, you actually get something called a tibble. Um, which is the tidyverse version of a data frame, which is slightly cooler, a little bit faster, a little bit easier to work with, and very occasionally breaks things in older packages. So one thing to look out for, like having in the back of your mind a failure mode of the tidyverse occasionally is incompatibility with non-tidyverse old stuff. So if it breaks, you can think about that. Otherwise, it should be totally transparent. OK, so um, we're going to be looking at the iris data set. IRIS is not a psychological data set. Um, it's a classic multivariate data set from the history of statistics. Um, it shows the measurements of a bunch of different instances of IRIS flowers from different species. Um, so OK, we can look at the IRIS data set without knowing anything about IRISes. Um, and we can see that it's got a bunch of rows in, in the head. Um, and each row shows um, for a particular species, so this is the Setosa species of IRIS, we've got four measurements. Um, so it, when I was using this data set for the first time, I looked up what these words mean. So petals, OK, those are the flower petals. Sapels are the things that kind of protect the flower, the flower petals. So whatever, an iris has like kind of two layers of petally things. And the sapels are the outside ones of the petal and the inside ones. That's not relevant. But maybe if you've learned one thing today, it's that the sapel is OK, um, so you've got the length and the width of each um, in some unknown units. I'm, I'm hoping these are centimeters, but I'm not sure. Maybe they're inches. Um, and uh, that's the iris data set. OK, so um, this is a data frame. Uh, and uh, we can see it has uh, distinct data types here. So these are doubles. Um, and then species as a factor, which is this 
again, um, our specific kind of foundational uh, data type, which uh, is actually coded internally, numerically, but has uh, readable labels, which makes your code and your data analysis a bit more readable. Um, so here's the funny thing about R. Um, R is a very, very flexible programming language. Um, that could, can be a strength, but it's also, in many ways, a weakness. Um, and so data frames are kind of a classic example of this. And so in base R, data frames are like minimally three different data types. Um, and so you can get at them in a lot of different ways, and that can make your R code super confusing. So for example, probably if you've done any R, you've used dollar sign to access a column. So if you wanted um, iris sapel length, you could write um, iris dollar sign sapel length and get that column. Yeah, that's what you've done? OK. Um, you might not have known that you could also pretend that your data frame is a matrix, so you could actually index into it as iris 1, 1. That's weird, but it, it works. Or even iris double bracket, which is a list, which uh, accesses the first column of iris. You can also mix numeric references and name references. Iris, double bracket, quotes, sample length, quotes, double bracket. That's pretty crazy. Um, so um, I just want, you know, in the interest of, of uh, defining the problem space here and why coding uh, kind of consistently in R is hard, I want to take like 10 seconds and uh, turn to your neighbor, um, or Google if you don't want to talk to your neighbor, um, and try to uh, access the pedal length of the third iris in the data set, row three of the data set. Um, and uh, maybe uh, we, can, we can see who gets the most ways, unique ways, of retrieving that same value. Um, so so let's, let's take, let's take a, a timed minute and, uh, and give this a try. Um, I just, just want to illustrate a little bit of the horror of kind of uh, unsystematized R data analysis. So go ahead and, and give this a shot, referring to Iris, uh, Iris um, pedaling. That's just a, a quick little, little exercise. Don't worry if you haven't had time to, to fill out too many of these. Um, but maybe somebody can give me uh, one to start. Leave something to be desired, but that gets us the same answer. Um, one more for completion's sake. Identical to the fourth one, but instead of the three, right fit on it. Okay, 
So these are the five I came up with in a few um, minutes of thinking about this. Uh, you could also name um, row three Bob and refer to it as Bob um, in quotes if you wanted. That would be a feature feature that you could uh, take advantage of here. The point is, this is very ambiguous. Um, and so one point I want to make about this is that it makes life really complicated as a reader of code, um, as a debugger. Um, it's, it's really uh, pretty hard. Um, the other thing I want to, um, to note is, is that um, these ways aren't all born equal. They're, some are better than others. Um, so what concerns might we bring up when we're trying to figure out which way to uh, look at um, the representation? What, what would lead us to want to use one of these ways of referring to, um, to elements in the data frame over others? Knowing the kind of data you're accessing, is it pebble length? Is it width? Yeah, so, so knowing, um, so in particular, you might want to know the data type of that column. Yeah, absolutely. That said, if you want to run the same function over like 10 columns, then using the numbers means that you can be flexible about it. Yeah, flexibility in terms of uh, programmatic access to particular um, parts of the data set. Anything else? Last concern I just want to bring up here uh, is human readability. So for me, uh, again, showing my age, um, in my transition away from MATLAB, which was for a time in the 2000s the dominant paradigm for behavioral data analysis, to R, the key feature, the single key feature that made me switch was uh, the human readability of labels. That I could propagate, uh, propagate human readable labels through my code to the visualizations. Uh, without ever referring to things numerically. And I actually have a horrifying story to share that motivates that decision. And so, um, you know, basically all of my uh, programming elections with respect to data analysis are all about human readability and debuggability um, kind of on the face. So back in graduate school, my, uh, one of my first experiences working with the data set was a data set that I collected as a research assistant before graduate school was habituations with babies. Um, you get babies bored with something and then you change it and see if they retain interest. Uh, and I was analyzing a data set that had been collected by my mentor at that time. I wrote up my first first author journal paper on this. Um, I don't think it ended up published first, but it was I think the first one I wrote. Um, I did the data analysis in MATLAB, which I learned in my university statistics course uh, in graduate school. And uh, I reported my conclusions, I wrote the paper, and I sent it off. And it was reviewed, revisions, published, great experience, came out, three to five people might have read it. Um, I'm not sure, but they said they read it, I never got evidence of that. Um, and then approximately five years after that, I looked at the data set again, and I looked at the figure again, and I realized that I had made a horrifying column labeling error. Um, so habituation trials with a baby, you can go from the beginning to the end, or you can number reverse from when they got bored to when they started. And both would be columns 1 through 12 in that uh, So I had published a paper um, where thankfully only the you know, not super interpreted habituation trials had been completely flipped because there was non-semantic numbering. I was just numbering them by uh, the number in the data set. Uh, and there was an Excel spreadsheet that had labels like minus one, minus two, minus three that said it was reverse number, but I couldn't propagate that to MATLAB, so I just indexed into them as a one through 12 array. Uh, so as a result, the figure that then made its way into the scientific literature in my first paper, which was peer-reviewed by experts, uh, had habituation times that varied from like four seconds to 1.2 seconds. So babies are bored and bored easily, but they look for more than 1.2 seconds, usually. And when they see something new and hopefully interesting, they look for more than four seconds. It was actually, the actual value was about 55 seconds. But nobody noticed that order of magnitude error in the figure, including me, my co-authors, there were several, and the reviewers, and apparently any of the readers until I was reviewing these data for another purpose. Um, and all of this happened because of uh, the lack of semantic labeling from the human readable Excel sheet where the data had been entered to the code. So I had a terrible sinking feeling in my heart 
um, and then eventually realized it wasn't the end of the world, uh, issued a, um, a correction notice. We published it around them. The paper now has the full red text at the top, and there's a revised version of that figure. And thankfully, none of the conclusions changed. But that would have been so easy to avoid had I been able to propagate semantically meaningful labels throughout my code. Uh, that uh, obvious uh, comprehension check of seeing, oh, why is the minus one trial the first one uh, that's plotted and the minus 12th is the last one, why is it not reversed? That would have saved me from that error. And there are a million cases where this comes up, where condition labels get flipped, where axes get flipped, um, where units are lost, because we can't semantically uh, understand code. So that's why I do all of this. And my move to the tidyverse is in part because it's so easy to understand the chain of semantically readable uh, labels that allow us to um, get from data to conclusion. OK. So um, what is a tidy data set, and how does a tidy data set enable this semantically readable, uh, easy to compose workflow? So the basic insight of tidy data is that uh, if all of your data sets are formatted in exactly the same way, conceptually, you can always do the same things to them. If they're formatted uh, in each in its own way, every meta data set being messy in its own way, then uh, you really don't know how to handle that data set. And so a lot of base R packages that you'll run into, you have to tell the, the package everything about your data set or format your data set in the special way that that package wants. Um, and both of those things are a huge pain. Either you have to specify like 17 different column label things, or else you have to reformat into this weird kind of funky data frame with extra columns over there so that uh, you can be in the right format. Tidy data is the one format to rule them all. It's the one ring, and uh, we all should bend to its evil powers or whatever, uh, so that every package can use the same format data and every package makes the same assumptions about the way the data are formed. And the basic idea is super simple. In tidy data, every row is a single observation. In psychology, we call that a trial. Every column describes a variable, and every variable for each row has a value describing that trial. So some of those values are the measurement on that trial, like a reaction time, an accuracy, a response, all that stuff. Some of it is descriptive, like who was that? What subject ID was that? Hopefully anonymous. Um, or uh, what condition were they in, or what's their um, sex, or maternal education, or whatever. Any of those demographic variables. So now that's going to create a little bit of redundancy. And that's why I say tidy data is great for small and medium data sets. For large data sets, that redundancy will kill you. For small and medium data sets, don't worry about it. It's nice. So if you are in a tidy data set, and you know that every row is a single observation, every column is a single variable, then you can do amazing things because you can take a uniform approach to the data. So here is a direct quote from R for data scientists. There's a general advantage to picking one consistent way of storing data. If you have a consistent data structure, it's easy to learn the tools that work with it because they have an underlying uniformity. And that uniformity here is going to be the same exact syntax for uh, doing different operations. And um, given that general advantage, there's also a specific advantage to tidy data where variables are their own column, and that's because R is vectorized, and so you can do the same thing uh, to every element of a column really fast and easily without extra syntax. Okay, um, so um, let, me, uh, let me talk a little bit about psychological data for a second, and then we'll do the exercise. So psychological data, uh, who, who here uh, collects experimental data with people or animals? Okay, good chunk of people. So um, we generally do two things when we're collecting psychological data and we're kind of keeping track of the data. One thing we do is tidy, um, where every trial is a row um, and every column is a variable. That's one thing that does happen. But the thing I got trained to do when I was collecting data and pasting them into Excel, um, and what I still see people doing, especially when they use programs like SPSS and others of this type, is um, what I would call wide data. So wide data is a data set where every row is not a single trial, but a single case. Um, so a single case would be like an entire subject um, where they did 40 trials, and trials 1 through 40 are kind of uh, over here as columns on the end. Um, and so you'll have like, you know, 
subject ID Bob 23, um, you know, then the demographics, and then trials 1 through 20 kind of lined up uh, on the side. So um, why data is what we do in psychology. It's easy to read in Excel, uh, but it causes a lot of problems in data analysis, and those problems are what we're going to solve by getting to type. Okay, so um, here is a data set that I, I collected for a class I was teaching. Um, these are data that are, with the exception of anonymization, um, as they were downloaded from Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is a crowdsourcing uh, service. People use AMT. Some people, so this is a common way of uh, collecting behavioral data very quickly uh, on the web with some limitations, but, but lots of advantages. Um, this experiment, and in this version of this experiment, is not exactly the original, but this experiment is a replication of a paper by um, Jenna Suski and Yui, um, which is a very cute paper. Uh, so basically, the idea is, if I tell you that a, um, uh, I was going to buy a plasma TV set, and the price was uh, uh, like $8,000, uh, oh no, maybe there's one a little more expensive. Um, you get anchored to $8,000, and so you kind of adjust the sort of appropriate cost of a more expensive one around that figure. But if I, uh, if I use a more precise anchor, like $8,025, then um, you stay closer. The anchor has kind of a greater effect because of the precision. That's pretty cool. Um, so uh, this is a replication of that. I used only three trials. Um, here are the data, um, and I've, I've read these in. Um, and let me show you what they look like here. So I'm just going to take the head. Um, so it's not super informative because um, there's a lot of like kind of Amazon mechanical Turk formatting stuff. Um, Todd um, may tell you a little bit about why you don't need to in include this text. Do this hit only once. This is an old version of mechanical Turk. Um, and so you get data, 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 data. Okay. Um, Here's the assignments, uh, uh, time, set time, and so forth. And then the input condition, which is what kind of anchor there is, the input price uh, for the, uh, the um, three trials, and then the answer that they gave for the cost of a dog, I don't know why this was the original, the cost of a plasma television, and the uh, cost of a sushi dinner. Um, so take a look at this data set with your neighbor briefly. Um, and uh, just as a uh, comprehension check on the idea of tidy data, sketch out a paper and pencil or just verbally what a tidy version of this data set would look like. So um, take maybe uh, two minutes and have this conversation. Um, having just looked at this either in the viewer window, which you can access using view, capital U, J-U. I think that'll work in the, um, on the RStudio instance or just on the command line. Okay, go ahead. So what will this look like tidy? Yeah, <laughs> 
So, um, so the first note here, this is exactly right, the first note here is that um, thinking about it as a tidy data set makes you think, okay, well this metadata here, do I really need it? How much of this do I need to, uh, to have in every single trial? Um, well, I need a unique identifier for the subject, and maybe if there's something else in here that's unique, defying, or interesting, or important for my later analysis, yeah. Um, but I could scrub out a lot of that stuff, and we'll talk about the uh, methods for selecting, uh, for selecting particular columns. Actually, called select. Um, so we'll, we'll do uh, we'll do that. Um, second point you made is is okay. Um, we're going to need to uh, to stack up the trials rather than have them in wide format. And since there are three trials, each participant will have three rows. Um, so go ahead. Was it that there was an anchor price for each question? Because you would stack those also, but I wasn't sure what they were anchoring. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm um, doing a little something, a little something about the data set would help with that. But, but basically, um, uh, so for each, uh, I would call them in psychological lingo an item. Um, you have an anchor price, and then you have a response. Then you um, would stack the anchor prices too. Exactly. So, so you have something like um, subject one was in condition, this condition, the item that they were doing was either sushi, dog, or plasma TV. Um, they have this anchor price for each of them, and then they have their response for each of them. Mm -hmm. So basically, you're taking one row per subject and turning it into three rows per subject. And because you've got a lot of metadata, you'd slim that down, but your overall data set does get bigger. Um, now, having done that, though, you're able to do a bunch of stuff, uh, like, for example, subtracting the anchor price and the estimate much more easily. Um, in this wide format data, subtracting the anchor price and the estimate is like, some kind of horrifying um, exercise in remembering what the names of the columns are. So you kind of scroll over here and you'd be like, well, what did I call this column in this bad version of the experiment? Input price one, which is not semantically labeled for the record, minus answer dog cost, comma price two, minus answer plasma. You get this really long thing that doesn't tell you what operation you're actually doing there. If they're stacked uh, next to each other, you can say uh, response, answer minus response or response minus answer, which tells you exactly what the computation is that you want to be doing. So you can name the vectorized computation appropriately, uh, and that tells you what your analysis is. I mean, hammering on the point of semantic labels, it looks like input price one corresponds to the plasma cost rather than the dot cost, even though that's the first response column. So if you, if, you know, that's an advantage, right, of doing the technique. Huge. Um, uh, I'm going to guess that this is um, AMT um, alphabetizing the answer dot fields here, which is just devastating, right? Um, you, you back infer that from the data because of a regularity that is presumed to be there, which is awesome. But relying on inferring regularities in the data is just a really, you know, it's a terrifying way to, um, to go about doing things in the general case. Because when your experiment goes wrong, you can't rely on those regularities. So, um, so it completely agree. Um, and um, will you will you talk at all about uh, about um, kind of naming the data piece by piece? Okay. Okay. So um, it, it's it's something for another day. Uh, and I have other horrifying lessons learned stories because um, I made every mistake there is, uh, or if I haven't, I will soon. Um, with respect to experimental data collection and analysis. But so, so um, it's a story for another day how you might design an experiment that maximizes your chances of uh, being able to pass through semantically labeled information. Um, and some of these data sets will have problems in that, uh, that type of work or different. Okay, so recap, tidy data, one trial per row. Again, um, if, it doesn't have, if, if there's multiple trials per row, you're not in tidy. 
Okay, so the second concept I want to uh, give you from the, uh, the tidyverse is the idea of uh, functions and pipes. So um, everything you typically want to do in statistical programming uses functions. What are functions? They're little animals um, that take inputs and give you outputs. Mean is a good example. It takes a bunch of numbers, it chews them up, and gives you an output. Um, it takes a lot of numbers, chews them up, gives you one number, but you could have equally well uh, a function that took one number and gave you a lot of numbers. It doesn't matter as long as you've got one of those little animals that eat something and provides outputs. Um, okay, uh, so um, here's an example of what we call function application. I'm applying the function mean to the pedal length column of the iris data set. So it's chewing up the entire column and spitting out just that one number. So we've applied this function. Um, now, why am I not just calling this taking the mean? Because that's what we're doing. Um, what I'm trying to do is recast some basic operations in base R as uh, the application of functions, because when we generalize these things, we're going to be thinking about the general notion of a function and its inputs and outputs. Uh, and when we're working in tidy data, we know what the inputs look like, and we're going to work with some restrictions on the output. The inputs are always going to look like data frames, um, and the outputs uh, will have some restrictions on them. Okay, so functions, we use them all the time, we apply them all the time when we're doing statistical programming. Um, we often apply them in sequences. So um, here uh, we're uh, writing mean of iris petal length. Um, we can, as a notational convenience, using um, a package which is baked into the tidy, uh, tidyverse, um, take the first argument of the function. The first argument of mean is iris petal length. It's its only argument. We can take that and factor it out to the beginning and write this pipe in here. So percent greater than percent. That's called the pipe. We're going to be using them a lot. Um, and then we pipe to mean. And we could equivalently um, and maybe more uh, transparently write mean friends friends. But let's leave it off. So we get the same output for running that. OK, so why are pipes useful? Pipes are not useful when you only do one thing. Pipes are useful when you do multiple things in a row. When you start nesting functions, it gets a lot better. Like, um, you might look at, for some reason, the number of unique uh, petal lengths in you know, iris petal length. It turns out they're 43. Uh, Maybe we, we were trying to solve that unique uh, element um, kind of checking problem. So, so there are actually 150 uh, uh, petal lengths in there, but there are only 48, 43 uh, unique ones. What's the mean of the unique ones? Different than the mean. Doesn't really matter. Um, so uh, the point here is that these, this string mean, unique, iris petal like is um, written in a way that's a little less semantically transparent. And again, this is going to be our theme throughout. Uh, then if we say, take iris petal length, then make it unique, then take the mean. So the pipe allows us to write the nested function application in a way that's sequential, which is how I think about data analysis. First we do this, first we take this, then we do that, then we do the other thing. Um, and the way that happens is by pulling out items. Um, and the items that we pull out are the first argument. So we could do this, we could do that, and if uh, mean had an argument, um, like na.rm equals true or something, um, we could do it that way. Um, so, so we can still give these functions other arguments, but critically what we're doing is we're pulling out that first one and putting it in front. And uh, this is just syntax. This is just a different way of writing exactly the same thing. But as our functions get complicated and as they get nested deeply, it's going to make our life super easy in terms of reading. OK. Um, so here's another case, right? So I'm, I'm just doing the same thing. Um, taking iris taking uh, the unique elements of it, taking their mean, and then rounding those such that they're two digits. Okay, now it's starting hopefully to become clear that it's easier to state this, you know, that's not our reading direction. We don't read from inside the braces to outside the braces. But if we use the pipe, we read from uh, left to right. Take iris, 
take the unique elements, take their mean, and then round it with two digits. And when you like, indent it, you get a chain like this, a chain of pipes. Iris petal length, unique, mean, round. All right, now it's starting to look like something that's kind of formatted clearly. I can see that this is a sequence. Um, it gets easier to read. Um, and these advantages are going to compound. Uh, because in the tidyverse, what we're going to do is do things over and over again to data frames. And we're going to rely on the fact that every function is going to return, it's going to take data frames and return data frames, and so we can just chain function application. And if we were chaining them in a big horrifying nest of parentheses, we'd die of parentheses poisoning. But if we can <laughs> chain them down the page, we can just read it as a sequence of operations, which is how we think about it conceptually. In fact, um, the way Hadley Wickham talks about this, he calls these verbs. They are literally actions that uh, operate over the data. And I think this is a totally brilliant move to think about data analysis as a set of affordances or actions that we can, uh, that we can uh, accomplish on data. Given a tidy data set, it has these affordances. I can select it, I can filter it, I can mutate it, I can um, split it, I can do all this stuff. I know I can do that because of its format. Um, and I can chain those things together to create uh, conceptual structures of data analysis that are much more complex than if I were writing it the old way. So I'm a kind of complete warfia on this set. Uh, so if you're familiar with uh, kind of psycholinguistic history, um, the Warfian hypothesis is the idea that the language you uh, speak shapes the way you think about the world. I think the tidyverse is a great example of a language that provides conceptual tools which re-express uh, operations that you already know how to do in simpler ways, allowing you to think more complex data analysis thoughts. Uh, you can, uh, I can now explain in the tidyverse language a complex series of, of uh, data analysis operations very quickly and accurately um, so that you can reproduce them, we'll hope, uh, in a way that I couldn't if I were telling you, for example, a set of Excel copy and paste steps, which would just destroy your mind. So back in the day when I wanted to take the mean, uh, let's, I'm going to call this um, uh, the mean of subject means. So that is, uh, for each subject, take their average and then average those averages. Um, what I used to do is I would go down my Excel spreadsheet and I would get the mean for each subject by selecting the cells for that subject and write in the mean, and then I would paste those out, and then I would sort them, and then I would take their mean. And it was, it was devastating. And just describing that takes a long time. Teaching somebody to do it takes a long time. Um, and doing it right is, is very hard. In contrast, if you write it in three lines of easy, um, semantically interpretable code, anyway, you can get my point. Good. OK. Um, so just as a, uh, as a comprehension check, um, rewrite this expression um, as a typed version. Um, so uh, yeah, this should take 15 seconds, 30 seconds, um, and just check that they uh, show the same pathway. Okay, um, how many iris species? Good. Um, and what's the pipe version look like? Um, good. Okay, we're going to pipe a lot. We'll get more practice with it later. All right, last piece of the workflow here, and then we'll end our kind of conceptual overview and workflow section. So, 
Uh, who's used ggplot2? Lots of people, great. Um, if you haven't used ggplot2, uh, you'll recognize the look of ggplot2 when we see it. Um, okay, ggplot2 is a plotting package that some people love, frustrates some people. Uh, the point I want to make here about ggplot2, and I'm not going to teach it here, uh, I'm just going to use it um, in little bits to plot things. The point I want to make here is that ggplot2 is a tidy data plotting package. Uh, it's all about having the same data format. And I think once you real realize that, a lot of the uh, conceptual difficulties with ggplot2 drop away. Um, that said, there are basically two uh, elements to a ggplot. Um, so ggplot is an object, and there's tons of elements to them. Uh, axes and so forth, but there are two that we're going to care about, and really one that relates to the tidy data concept, and that's this um, non-transparent string AES, which stands for aesthetic. So ggplot is a mapping of variables in a data frame, that is columns in a data frame, onto visual variables, like uh, x position, y position, color, symbol, size, transparency, <coughs> uh, and so forth. Um, so, because you're in tight data, you know that each column contains a variable, and every value for that variable is in that column. Every reaction time you collected in the experiment is in that one column called reaction time. And so, if you map reaction time to the vertical axis, you have a consistent mapping from the uh, language of data and variables to the visual vocabulary. And that's a critical step, uh, because then you can sub in lots of different plotting objects to represent those reaction times, or those accuracies, or those kettle and sample lengths, and so forth. Um, and those uh, different mappings are called geoms. So they're, geom is short for geometric object. Uh, so geoms are uh, plotting objects that represent the data, like points, lines, circles, areas, tiles, polygons, whatever those things are, ribbons, lots of different possibilities there. But the basic idea is that if you have the variable mapping, you can then select whether a line makes more sense, a bar makes more sense, a bunch of points make more sense, uh, a funny heat map makes more sense. Um, those choices are independent of the mapping between the data set and the visual variables, the axis. Um, so let's plot the um, iris data set. So um, I set up ggplot by creating a ggplot object here. Um, and the first argument, as with everything in the tidyverse, literally everything, is the uh, data set, the data frame. So iris is the data frame. And then the other thing that I do in this call is I set up my aesthetic mapping. And I'm using some shorthand here, but um, AES, I could say x equals sepal width, y equals sepal length, color equals species. So I'm mapping x to width, y to length, um, and uh, color to species. If I just do this, what's going to happen? an error hypothesis. Anybody else? I get a blank plot with sample width on the x-axis and sample length on the y-axis. So why did I get a blank plot? Because I didn't tell what kind of geometric object I wanted to represent those data. Um, if I add points, then I'm going to get the data represented on those axes. Um, and hopefully a legend, again, with the semantic mapping. So I didn't tell it to give me a legend. I get one by default, which, oh my god, thank you. Like, I flipped conditions so many times, but I was like, writing, you know, column one is um, condition one, condition you know, over, and column two is condition under. Says me, right now, while I'm tired. That's not the way we, yeah, so again, um, uh, passing semantic mappings through transparent. Okay. Um, so this is, uh, this is a ggplot of the iris data set, um, sort of somewhat pretty. Uh, just to make the piping point one more time, this is an operation over a data set, a data frame. So let's just get rid of that first argument here. So I can have that typos. Um, so I'm going to erase the first argument here. And I'm going to pipe it in. Iris pipe ggplot. Um, and now I can run the same thing and get the same result because I've taken that first element of the pipe out and I uh, took uh, first element of the function out, first argument of the function out, and made it the first element of the pipe chain. 
Okay, and just to let you know my biases, um, fundamentally I could spend this entire lecture talking about visualization because it's fun and pictures are beautiful, but um, to make this a little bit prettier, um, what I'm going to do is add two things that I want to advertise. One is um, a, uh, a less GG plotty theme. So this is GG Themes um, theme Q, um, which is named after a visualization guy um, whose last name is Q. Um, and uh, scale color solarized, which is a little prettier than the salmon thing that constantly shows up in GG Plot. Um, so it's the solarized palette, which is one palette that's kind of used commonly. And um, you see now we have a kind of nice box around things, but we don't have this kind of potentially sort of obtrusive gray background that everybody associates with GG Plot. This looks more just like a plot. It doesn't make you think, oh, they're using R, hello. <laughs> um, it just makes you think, ah, oh, they're the data. Um, and we could get even better here. We could get fancier. We could use a palette that's more colorblind friendly and so forth. Um, so we could, we could definitely make progress on this visualization. Um, we could have consistent capitalization of labels. Yes? Can you scroll back up to where you catch your painting? Oh, sure, yeah. Um, let me do it on this one again. So um, first argument, take it out, stick it in front. So any function uh, can hmm? any function um, in the tidyverse takes a data frame as its first element, so it can be usefully applied to it in a pipe chain. Okay, um, so this ends the very first section of this tutorial. Um, what I tried to do in the first section of this tutorial is get you familiar with the conceptual toolkit of the tidyverse. And that's basically uh, tidy data. Every row is a trial, every row is an observation. And then um, repeated application of functions via these pipe chains. Those are the two big conceptual chunks that we need to master here. And why do we do it that way? We do it because of semantic transparency um, and uh, consistency across, um, across different data sets. OK, um, so let me pause here for questions before I show you how the tidyverse works on a typical psychological data set. Thoughts, questions, extensions? Yes? Your simple topics exist in Python? Great question um, that I don't know the answer to. I'm looking at Jess. Do pipes exist in Python? In Python? Uh, no, but um, the sort of like equivalent thing is like rather than having the, the functions wrap and so so Python is sort of the solution to that you don't have to have the functions wrapping on the outside. And in Python, you do dot and then the function name, and so you can chain the dots. So the dots are sort of the equivalent of the same thing. Okay, so, so, so dots. So the answer to the question was, um, uh, can you do function chaining with pipes in Python? And no, the answer is you get um, uh, kind of the same semantic uh, feature by using dots, which also order things in the uh, kind of readable order of the application. And that's just the default way to do it. So when we did it this morning in, in the uh, like the pandas tutorial, you go back and look at some of those cells and see they're all chaining dot dot function dot function dot function. Dot function. And uh, so 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 just this point is we, we actually you guys did that in the pandas tutorial. And my point on top of that is and you didn't even notice because it was easy to read. <laughs> um, if if uh, Jess had done the pandas tutorial at Lisp. You'd have been like, oh my god, the parentheses, um, because you would have been all nested up. But this was just natural. You're just like, oh yeah, you do the thing, and then the thing, and then the thing. Because that's how we think and read. OK, and uh, there's one more question. Yeah, OK. Yeah, good. All right, OK, so how does um, the tidyverse help with psychological data analysis? Um, this is all uh, uh, R for Data Scientists, chapter 5. Uh, OK, so let's take a psychological data set. Here are the raw data from um, Stiller, uh, Goodman, Frank, 2015. Um, so uh, Stiller, Goodman, Frank, 2015 is a paper that was done by a master's student in my lab. It's actually the first master's student in my lab, a really nice guy, um, Alex Stiller. And uh, he showed kids a bunch of trials that were meant to probe their pragmatic inferences, their inferences about um, using language and context. So um, don't have a whiteboard, um, so I'll just pull up a thick paper. Oh, I do have a whiteboard. Nice. Okay, awesome. So then you can see the incredibly sophisticated stimulus that we used to um, probe something's understanding. And my great artistic skills at the same time, all on display. Okay, so we 
showed kids displays like this one, and we said we had this kind of crazy monster who didn't know his friends or his house, or he was trying to help him because he, he was really confused. Um, and here are some people, and he says, my friend has glasses. And you say, which one is Kerbal's friend? Um, and hopefully you guys, like people on the internet, and as you'll see, some kids uh, think that it's the guy with glasses and a no-hat. <laughs> okay, so, so um, the idea here is that you kind of, I said glasses, or purple said glasses, and you think, well, if he meant the guy with the hat, he would have said hat, but he didn't say that, it was probably the guy with just glasses. So that's kind of a cute little inference that people make, we sort of explored this in some of our psychological research. Um, let's analyze the data from this experiment. And uh, critical for you to know is that there weren't just glasses, there were also hats and glasses, there were also houses, with um, you know, kind of flowers and I think trees. There were uh, plates of pasta um, with meatballs um, and sauce. Um, and then there was one other, which I won't strain my artistic talents showing you. Okay, so there are a bunch of items here. Okay, um, so we're gonna work with the tidy form of these data for now. And we'll talk about how to get to tidy in a moment. These data, um, they're tidy in the following way. Each row is a single trial. Each column is some aspect of that trial, including their subject ID, their age, um, and this is going to be in years, their condition, uh, and the item, which thing Perl is trying to find. So that's like the, the houses, the, um, the pasta, and so forth. Um, the two conditions are uh, label, which is the experimental condition, which I just showed you, in which Perl actually labels the thing. Um, my friend has glasses. And then the uh, no-label control condition, where Purple is eating too much peanut butter and can't talk. And so um, you're trying to help Purple find his friend, and you just go, blah, 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 because this is for three year olds, and that's what we do. Um, and so that, that's like a control condition. Like, um, they choose the guy with the glasses alone, not because he's so interesting and cool that you think he's definitely Purple's friend, but because he said uh, glasses. So it's, kind of, it's just a kind of a manipulation check. OK, so that's the data set. Um, we're going to manipulate these data using verbs from ply, the deep ply. Deep ply. Um, and I'm going to teach four verbs, which are the most common in my workflow, but there are tons of others. And if you're interested in these, I recommend, alongside our for data scientists, our studio has a bunch of great cheat sheets on uh, deep ply or data manipulation verbs. So. Um, they're not good for learning the verbs, but they're good for becoming aware of different verbs or remembering them if you know them already. Okay, so the four verbs I'm going to teach are filter. Filter removes rows based on some logical condition. Mutate, which creates new columns. Group by, which groups the data into subsets or sub data frames by some column of interest or some columns. And summarize, which applies some function or functions over columns in each. Those are the uh, abstract descriptions of these in kind of function application tidy data language, but let's see what they actually do, and then you'll have a better flavor for having things. Um, so go ahead and execute the um, data read and take a look at it. You can um, see the data set here. So um, each row has um, one of the four observations for the particular subject. Um, so faces, they were correct. Uh, there, this was a two-year-old in the label condition. Houses was correct. Pasta was incorrect. Bed was incorrect. Typical two-year-old. Two-year-olds can't do anything right. At least not when you ask them to. They can do it when you're not asking. Uh, Anybody have a two-year-old? Um, I have a three-year-old, and I'm glad she's not a two-year-old. Okay. Um, so uh, this is the data set. Um, so um, let's just, I'm just walking you through the, the kind of workflow here. We can expect, inspect the variables uh, in, the, um, in the data frame before you start the analysis. Um, many uh, statistical data analysis courses will say, run a summary. Um, you can do that. To be honest, I don't find it very useful. What you get is for each variable, um, its length, its class, and mode, its modal entry. These are characters. This is a, um, this is the correct variable, and you get these, uh, you know, quartile, um, medium, medium, max, min. It's, you know, this kind of is overwhelming for me for big data sets, and for small data sets, it's not that useful. 
I, I, I'm not that into it. Um, I like you know, looking at each thing by itself, depending on its data type. So you could look at the um, label, you could look at how many subjects there are, or you could be tidy and type this, right? So I took out the first one, then I took out the next one, and then I got unique, or then I got my, my type chain. two conditions on 147 subjects. We ran a lot of kids in this. Um, I also like um, interactive tools. So Vue is one that comes built into uh, uh, RStudio. Um, so if you're using RStudio and you're local, um, you, know, you can go to Vue, the capital V, and then you've got this kind of little spreadsheet-like representation. Um, so that's kind of cool. You can sort. That's fun. Um, I, also, like um, this uh, DT package offers a thing called data table. So um, one theme that I'll bring out uh, later in terms of uh, R and R Markdown in our studio is that um, when we knit documents um, written in R Markdown and they become HTML, they can incorporate all the cool interactive stuff that lives on the World Wide Web. Um, and data tables are one JavaScript package that lives there. So you can run this, and then you get this pretty little, like. Uh, probably very recognizable to you, JavaScript widget, which is a data table. So you can show 100 entries if you want for some reason, or just 10. You can search, you can sort, you can browse. So this becomes kind of a nice little widget if you want to uh, share the browsable experience with other people. Uh, you can publish this kind of data table to the web um, pretty easily, and that's kind of fun for people exploring the data. Um, I like this as a kind of a nice feature, and uh, you know, the DT package is super simple. That's, I, I actually don't know if there's any other command in the DT package. Um, <laughs> I just do this, and it makes nice tables. Okay, um, so all right, we looked at the data. We have some sense of what's in there, um, some subjects, some items, some correct age, condition. Uh, now let's um, filter and mutate. Those are our first two uh, verbs. So, there are tons of reasons why you might want to remove rows from your data set. I think of this, you know, so filter is kind of an obvious name for the action of removing rows. You've got the whole data set, and you've got this filter, um, and only certain rows pass through the filter and go on to later stages of your uh, analysis. So why would you want to do this in psychology? You might get rid of outliers. You might select a subpopulation. So filter is a verb. Um, it takes a data frame as its first argument, because every single verb we use will take a data frame as the first argument. And then its second argument takes the condition you want to filter on. So a condition here is a logical statement that says, um, does my row pass through or not? So um, if you want to look only at two-year-olds in this data, you could do a filter. Um, you could even do um, two conditions. So you could also do age greater than two uh, and age less than three. Or you could even write age greater than two, age less than three. So you can give a list of conditions as well. Um, so that's, that's equivalent syntax here. Okay. Um, so we're gonna be using types with functions. Um, so we were using simple functions like mean or unique or length, but we're gonna be typing dplyr verbs, types. So, uh, and these dplyr verbs are pipeable because they take data frames and they give back data frames. They are the same species of animal. The bird is an animal now. Those are our two metaphors. Okay. Um, so, uh, dplyr verbs take data frames as the first argument, pipes pull out the first argument, and so the data frame just kind of goes through these pipes. Okay, now you can see why you want to call them pipes. There's like, you know, you have a third metaphor, right? Here's our data frame. We shove it through this one, which has a little like strainer or filter on it, and then we shove it through this one, which is going to like change its shape in some way, and you know, right? We're going to keep pushing data through pipes, and the pipes are actually little animals that are actually actually. Yeah. So um, we could draw these later, and you can see how well that would come out. Um, okay, so 
the huge insight of DeepFlyer is you can chain these verbs into real and efficient sequences of operations, provided the verbs have their same syntax and the data have the same structure. So let's actually filter something. So here's um, just the two-year-olds of SGF. So we piped the SGF data frame to filter, and then we gave our conditions. We could do that. Um, but the list form is actually even easier to read because you can list the conditions very clearly on separate lines, and indenting is always your friend. Okay, um, so take one minute um, and just convince yourself that you um, understand the logical condition um, bit of, uh, of the filter statement by filter out only uh, the face trial in the uh, no label, or let's say just the label condition. So uh, go ahead and take a minute and give that a try, just uh, generating that, that statement by hand. Um, for my own information, um, can you, since a lot of you still have the blue post-its, can you add or remove the blue post-its depending on whether that worked for you? Okay, good. So it looks like um, I'm still seeing a bunch of blue post-its, but not complete blue post-its. Um, so, uh, um, can somebody uh, tell me how they did this that worked? behind the first four rows. So let me um, now kind of just show you that this same workflow is accomplished uh, in a, a whole variety of ways in base R. Um, again, kind of motivating um, why this is kind of a little weird. So for example, we could do something like this, um, SGF, and now this is what I used to do, address this as a matrix. Um, we want all the columns and we want rows that are uh, uh, that satisfy the logical condition SGF dollar sign condition equals equals label and SGF dollar sign item equals equals basis. And we get the same data frame, I believe. But um, th these sorts of things, uh, especially this like missing element comma syntax, just destroys people when they're reading your code. Um, So uh, this kind of thing is kind of hurtful. <laughs> Can I do that? Yeah. I don't know, even know how 
to notate that in a way that's clear because I can't get the comment in before the bracket, so it's just terrifying. Um, okay. All right, so that's filtering. Um, so uh, filtering as it remo or removes rows, removes observations. There are also times when you want to add or remove columns. Actually, we had a great example of that, seeing this Amazon Mechanical Turk uh, data set that just had tons of metadata at the front end. Um, uh, there's not much to simplify in this data set, but if you wanted to do that, the verb is select, and it's super easy to use. So for example, I could write uh, SGF, select, um, so I, I, could, I could select positively or select negatively. Um, so let's select positively, like I could just take out, I could just um, take uh, age, sub ID, um, and correct or something. This is a super minimalist version of the data. That's one way to do it, so I named all the data, uh, the data columns that I wanted. Um, I could also do this negatively though. So I could um, say I just don't want condition. For some reason I'm trying to blind myself to condition or something. I could just minus condition. And now I get the data set without the condition. So that's pretty nice. Um, just a kind of simple thing that you're able to do. Um, another feature that I'm not going to uh, go through in much depth, but just want to mention, is that you can actually select things um, uh, for, uh, by a variety of logical um, primitive so you, uh, regular expressions, other things. You could um, even select things by number if you were so inclined to break the semantic transparency. You could select one. Um, I don't know why you do that. Well, I'll, you'll see why you might want to do that. You could select um, starts with sub, because I can't remember what sub ID is, or I have multiple variables named sub. There's a whole bunch of stuff you can put in these that's really helpful and easy to work with. Um, and, you know, as always, Select is your friend. Question select. Um, and so there's a number of special variables, um, special functions, and you get some starts with, ends with, contains, matches. There's like a bunch of kind of cool stuff you can do there that's sort of nice. So, um, So there's a bunch of code now um, in my version of this tutorial that you guys won't have written down. I will push all of this so that it's accessible to you and you'll have the link um, afterwards. So don't worry about writing down anything you want to keep from this. There would be a bunch of things that I have that um, will get shared. Um, can you uh, remind us if you wanted to create a new Great point. So simple assignment. Um, yes. Uh, uh, actually, um, that's going to bring us uh, kind of um, down here. So maybe let me highlight that in the next context. Okay. So, um, uh, so we can always assign the result of a pipe chain in the, base, the same way that we normally would. I'm using arrow here. Um, you can use equals equivalently, but um, if you're sort of a semi-old school R person, you use arrow. Um, <laughs> We won't talk about that. We'll just accept it as it is. And then you can write equals if you are a normal person um, and haven't read a style guide on R that for some reason says this. OK, so, um, so assignment like this will be kind of how you get this pipe chain into something else. Um, and that'll look just like a Python notch if you're anything else. OK, um, so a uh, more useful thing, um, uh, or even more useful thing, is adding columns to a data set. Um, so we often derive variables. Uh, we often uh, kind of add information by a computation um, to a data set. And a mutate is the verb for these situations. It's a, the metaphor is not as good, um, I have to say. But mutating a column is creating a new column uh, that is based on that first column. So um, uh, let's add, uh, let's use mutate to add a discrete age group factor to our data set. So we had a numeric age that spanned from two to four years. Um, oh, sorry, if we go back up to our summary. The min age was two, the max age was 4.96. So um, what I want to do is group my kids up um, in the study by um, how old they are, and I'll call a two-year-old any kid between two and four. Uh, convention and uh, a three year old is any kid between three and four, three zero and four, eleven and however many days in the month, which is the real unit. Um, okay, so I, what I'm going to do is, is take SGF and I'm going to pipe it to mutate, and mutate is uh, 
um, is going to take um, a variable which is going to be the name of my new column and uh, what that variable is going to be computed by. And so here I'm going to use the function cut, which simply cuts up a numerical variable into discrete bins. Um, and I'm going to say include lowest because I want that 2, 0 to go in there as well. So let me show you what that looks like. So um, cut takes age, and um, then it cuts it into the range 2 to 5, and include lowest um, means that in an interval from uh, including 2 to including 3, then from just above 3 to 4, then from just above 4 to 5. And so now I have a factor, um, 2 to 3, 2 to 3, 2 to 3, so forth, um, that tells me what age group I'm in. Okay, so a couple things I want to highlight about this. The old way I used to do this was SGF age group is cut SGF age 2 to 5 include lowest true and so forth. So I would assign it separately. There'd be kind of a separate assignment. Um, that's fine. Um, that's totally reasonable. Um, a nice thing about these mutates is you can do a couple of them. So uh, you can add uh, several in the list. Age group, half year, is uh, equals cut, age, seek, 2 to uh, 2, 5.5. 5. I think that's the sequel syntax. Include lowest. So now I've got several of these things, and I would have to break those out as this. That's fine. Um, this is not a crazy syntax. Um, it's just a little annoying to have to do over and over again, and then uh, to break your chain of operations by adding new variables. Specifically, the only thing I want to note about this old syntax is you had to index into the data frame every time. The commands you were using didn't assume you were only operating within that particular data frame. In contrast, over here, I just assumed that age was a variable in that data frame. And that's really kind of nice and natural. Um, if you're an old school R person, you could say something like SGF age group with SGF cut age to five. Has anybody seen this? This is like a thing. Um, so it just says, um, assume that I'm in this data frame uh, uh, or um, even older than that, um, some people may have seen attach. Have any of you attached a data frame in R? Thank you. Okay, a few, I've got a few like sort of shame-faced nods. Don't do this. <laughs> um, just keep, we won't talk about it more. Don't do it. Um, uh, with this kind of clunky too. Um, I'm, this is uh, the tidyverse solution to this is to um, assume that the primary namespace of this very, uh, variable uh, is the data frame. And then it'll look outside of that namespace if it can't find age. So I could um, create something named age in here and mess it up, potentially. But it'll primarily look for age in the data frame. And that's kind of nice. Because uh, uh, especially if you name your data frame something a little bit more descriptive, it's going to get terrifying, right? Right, that's going to look terrible. Yeah. Um, and you don't want to use really short, um, uh, uninformative names like SGF um, just because you don't want to have to retype it a bunch of times. Um, much easier to have a namespace that presupposes the informative name for your data. Okay. Um, so, all right, we got um, filtering and mutating. Uh, on to our next two, grouping and summarizing. Summarize as an S because Hadley Wickham is a Kiwi. I don't know. That's a thing. OK, grouping alone doesn't do much. Um, grouping is not very useful. Uh, so SGF, um, if you just look at SGF, um, it looks like this. If you look at that, uh, it looks like this. It doesn't appear to have done anything, especially in this viewer mode. Um, SG, uh, group by does a special thing to uh, data frames, though. It adds a little bit of metadata, which are the grouping variables, the grouping columns. Um, and why is that important? Um, because um, when you combine this with 
functions that operate over sub-data frames, they will work within the grouping structure. Okay, in psychological terms, sometimes we want the mean over all the trials, but sometimes we want the subject mean. So for each subject, take the mean. Sometimes you want the item mean. For each item, take the mean. Sometimes you want the trial type by subject mean. For each subject, for each trial type, give me the mean. Or for each subject, for each condition, or for each subject, for each item. That grouping structure is what group by gives you. Um, back in the day, we write terrifying, terrifying pieces of code um, that maybe some of you have written. You know, for i in one, two, blank, unique, uh, SGF item for j in one to length unique SGF condition right has anybody written this code oh I saw a lot of nods oh okay. more than attaching data frames wow okay um, all right so now what do we get for there right, this is our item by condition mean now we're going to index in um, SGF so this data, I did, I did this a lot, SGF, all the columns, rows such that SGF item equals equals unique SGF item I, and, right, this is terrifying, right? You, we could add some like zero one indexing problems here if we wanted to make it just awful, but it's bad enough as it is. Okay, um, do a thing, this data, bind together somehow. <laughs> <laughs> summarize does, which is applying functions, and then let's put together group by and summarize, and we'll never write this code again, ever, <laughs> ever, ever, and we'll be so happy, because that was a lot of code. Okay. Um, so SGF, um, summarize, we put pipe it to summarize, summarize takes as its first argument, the data frame, which we piped out. Now, we're going to define a new variable in our summary data frame, which is going to be a teeny little data frame that just has a summary of the data. Our variable is called correct. How we compute correct, we apply a function to a, one or several columns. So our function here is mean, our column is correct. So all this does is it takes all the values in the column correct, and it averages them and returns a summary data frame. But our summary data frame has exactly one row and one column. It's called correct. And that's the grand mean across all trials. Okay, so the syntax here summarize takes multiple new column name equals function to be applied to data, data column uh, entries. So using that syntax, we can create more elaborate summaries. So you could do um, correct a number of observations. So now you get two columns in your summary data set. Okay, that's sort of useful. That's kind of nice. These summary data sets are good. But where this is going to shine is when you group the data. Because when you group it into subgroups, now you're going to get summary data sets that are really worth something. So um, if we group SGF by age group and condition, and then apply the same set of summary functions, correct a number of observations, we get something that's actually useful. This is like actually what you want as the experimenter. Um, they, here's the age group, here's the condition labels, um, and here's the percent correct for each condition and the number of observations. Um, so now we can see that um, even the two-year-olds were a little different, two to three-year-olds were a little different in the label condition and the no-label condition. Even intransigent two-year-olds knew what verbal meant here, indicating that they were doing some limited kind of pragmatic inferencing. Um, that is, thinking about what somebody meant by saying the word glasses here, not just literally applying it to both of the two things that had glasses. 
On the other hand, um, that's really because what we can get is the data. Um, so there's there's some interpretive stuff here, but this is the, these are the data we want to actually be able to interpret. Okay, so a couple things that you see here. Um, here's the assignment operator. So I created this data frame SGF means, which is derived from SGF. Um, so that's a summary data set that I want to store and use for stuff, maybe plotting later. Um, and second, oh. Oh, so easy. Just change the semantic grouping variable. So awesome. OK, um, go back up to our for loops, right? We have to change the indexing, the uniques, this thing here. There's a lot of copy and paste and craziness that uh, results from all of this indexing code. Um, the function application changes the units over which the functions are applied, the sub data frames over which the functions are applied. Uh, and then does the same thing. Um, so all that's happening here uh, that's different is the big data frame at the beginning is getting sliced up in different ways by the group guide, and then summarize is doing the same thing in each little piece of it. So that's very refreshing. And these summary data are very, very useful for plotting purposes. So if we do SGF means, so that's our, our means data frame, um, we can set an aesthetic in ggplot, as x equals age group, y equals correct. So age on the x always, because time goes horizontally in English. Um, y is correct, um, so the accuracy up is good, so our plot is consistent with our metaphors. Condition by color, um, and then we did this group uh, just to make lines connect to one another on the GG plot. And then our lines are going to be our, our modality of interest here. And so here's our, um, our plot. Uh, so um, in the control condition, performance went down. Uh, uh, because and because actually the guy with the hat and glasses is more interesting as a uh, label condition performance went up. Um, now this plot is um, suboptimal for a bunch of reasons. We could clean it up. Um, uh, we could we have a good nice theme. We could set a y limit um, that's reasonable. Um, you know we could even make it not salmon if we wanted, but. You know, this is the start of a thing that we actually want. And uh, if you actually um, were eliminating code here, we got from, you know, uh, we, we had essentially uh, just a few steps in our pipe, right? So we went from SGF, we had a mutate to add age group. We had a group by, and we had a summarize, and we had a GT. And that's it. So that's, that's my um, data analytic workflow right there. That's a set of verbs applied in an extremely terse and easy way to produce more or less what we want. So. Um, OK. So um, the last thing we're going to do before taking a break um, is to generalize this workflow, do a little comprehension check um, by uh, um, analyzing this in the proper way. So. We're going to take the mean for each participant. Then we're going to look at the variability across participant means. So um, this analytic workflow is going to require grouping, then summarizing, then grouping again, and then summarizing again. So it's two stages rather than one stage. Um, in for loop land, this will just destroy you. Um, so uh, try to use dpar to make the same table as above, SGF means but with the means and standard deviations, if you want, uh, computed across subject means, not across all data points as we did before. This will be pretty similar in this particular design because it's balanced, there's not a lot of missing data, but in a case with missing data or unbalanced uh, designs, this is gonna vary. Um, so uh, give this a try. I'm, I'm gonna give you uh, five minutes um, to do this if you um, end Sooner, um, we're going to take a, a kind of a 10 minute, 7 to 10 minute break after this. So we're probably going to pick up in total um, at 10 of 3. So um, go ahead and give it a shot. Um, and uh, here I'm just going to wander around. So if you want questions answered, please use your red post it.
Um, so let's pause for a little bit and, and uh, take a, uh, a bathroom break and stretch break and uh, pick up again in eight-ish minutes at, uh, at 10 of 3.
have um, kind of repeated summarizes, which will remove successive elements of that group by statement. The reason I think it's confusing is because you have to know that that's how summarize works, is that it removes those things. Um, so you have to know kind of a fact about uh, summarizes operation, whereas if you do this, it's kind of a little bit more explicit. Oops. Put that in here. And I saw one um, solution uh, walking around that I also use, um, which is uh, in term assignments. So rather than chaining these things, you could call this SGF means, or even sub means, and then SGF brand means, or something like that. And so uh, doing this would then um, give you a chance to be able to use the subject means for one purpose, like plotting the variability in points, and use the grand means for another purpose, like plotting lines. So that can be a helpful um, functionality. OK, um, so we played with tidy data a bunch there. That was tidy data. We applied verbs to it, uh, tidy data. How do you get to tidy? In particular, how do you take that psychological format, or RA entered format, uh, wide data, where you've got different trials as columns, all with the same you know, values of the same variable in them as different columns, how do you shove all of those columns down into a longer form, tidier data set? Um, this actually used to, just to add another metaphor, it used to be called melting the data. I thought of the big one, like iceberg, which you'd melt down and it would drip down into a tidy data. Um, there's a lot of metaphors happening, but uh, thankfully that metaphor is gone. Um, so um, uh, the two main verbs for tidying come from the package tidier, um, and they are gather and spread. Um, uh, there are also a bunch of other cool things in the tidier package, which I won't talk about, but are worth um, knowing about if you're actively tidying. So first, we're going to um, go away from tidiness. We're going to create a wide form data set. Um, we're going to spread it out. So here's our, and that's because the metaphor works well. So here's our big tidy data set, and we're going to Schmear it out until it's wide. Um, yet another metaphor is cream cheese pad, we spread it over the wide bagel. Um, get, sort of get all those variables out there. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is uh, take the, um, the data that we had from SGF, which is in ID format. So we've got some ID variable, subject ID, and condition and so forth, and then here's the actual data. This is like correct. That's the actual variable that we care about here. Um, and we've got this big long data set here. Um, and we've got our items, item one through n, then you know, kind of finishing out our subject, where it is a space, house, et cetera. Um, and what we want to do is we want to uh, spread these guys out so that we've actually got a face column, a house column, uh, and so forth. And the correct value for this one goes over there, the correct value for this one goes over there, the correct value for this one goes over here, and like that. So we're going to take this nice tidy data and turn it wide, spread it out. Um, and there's a really simple way to do that, which is with the spread verb. So spread takes a data frame piped in, typically. And we choose what thing we want to be the column labels in the new wide data frame. So that's the items here, because item is a unique designator for each trial. And then what do we want to be the values in those columns? And here it's the correctness of the response to that item. So that's it. It's just two calls here. So here's SGF wide. Or, uh, so again, we have the subject ID, but now notice each subject ID only enters into one row because we're in wide data, so in one case in SKFS terminology. Their age, their condition, their age group. And we get some kind of crazy error if we tried to consolidate across subjects because these, things, these values that I've highlighted wouldn't be unique. They would be trying to smoosh together age and condition and be kind of a big mess. Um, but within a subject, they're, uh, they're all the same. Um, there's one unique age for that subject, and so we can smush them. And then we get a correct value for uh, beds, spaces, houses, and pasta. So um, now we have this wide version of the data set. Now, note something that's kind of interesting and characteristic of wide format data of the type that we use in uh, psychology. Um, 
nothing tells you these ones and zeros respond, correspond to accuracy or correctness on the task. The uh, variable that these are, correctness, what they measure, and their units, if it had a unit, unit would all be lost. Um, that's why like, some programs will actually have two layers of uh, column labels. There'll be a big thing up here with a bracket that says accuracy above this, which is kind of gross and doesn't work with tabular data and GSP <coughs> format or whatever. Um, but that's kind of an intrinsic flaw of the Y format. Of course, the nice thing is that it's all compressed and we can see much more of the data in one screen here. So that, there's some positives. Okay, um, so I'm going to show you how to come back from wide to, uh, to tidy, to, to long, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the conceptual model here. This is a very simple operation that I find conceptually a little tricky and takes a little bit of practice. So I'm going to convert wide to long back again and then we'll practice it. Okay, so this is the explicit specification point. Um, okay, so how do we get from, uh, from wide, like, like this, where each, uh, each row is a particular case, back to our original format? We're going to use the verb gather. And honestly, I think the metaphors are just going wild here, so I'm not even going to try to enact this. Um, but uh, what we're going to do is gather a bunch of columns, the columns that you previously spread, for example, and you're going to specify, this is the, I think this is the tricky conceptual step. You put in that big superordinate <laughs> label up here. You specify what they all have in common. They are all correctness. And then you specify the name of this variable. What are those things? Those are the items. So these are the items, and what the item columns previously contained is the correctness of the response on that item. So those are the two pieces of data that uh, uh, that gather needs. Um, so you spread uh, item into correct, and now you gather item and correct. So um, this is kind of counterintuitive. When you say gather, you're making up two names for variables that don't exist in your Y data set, right? Nowhere in your Y data set does it say that the column labels are all items and that the values in the columns are all correct, but that's what you have to tell to gather. You have to give it information that you want a column called item and you want a column called correct that corresponds to the things in each item. So you have to make up two new names and you could call those Bob and Joe. I'm just calling, I'm calling them item and correct because I spread them from those columns. And there's one other thing that gather needs, which is which uh, uh, of the columns are item columns. And for that, we're going to have one of those selecting specifications. Uh, so here I just enumerated the list. Um, so, okay, so this is uh, SGF long is going to be uh, a transformation of SGF wide, which is the data frame we we're just looking at above. And we're going to gather, we're going to gather the items and create a column that has the value for each item, which is their correctness. And then there are going to be four columns that get gathered in this way, beds, spaces, houses, pasta. And again, we could, uh, we could index into these a different way, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we could um, do uh, we could index into these any way we want. We could say um, starts with foo and so forth. There's lots of different ways to gather, but if we gather this way, then we get our original data set back. Okay, so um, I find this the conceptually trickiest part of gathering. So spreading is, is easy because you have a column for item and you have a column for correct and you just want to get smushed out that way. Gather you have to think about what data set you want to have and what those tidy columns will be called and then name the part of the data that's not there, right? So you have to name the part of the data that isn't, uh, isn't written in, what the values are called and what the column labels all have in common. We're gonna practice this. Okay, um, so, um, let us uh, look at a data set. 
Um, so the data set is um, called SPLAR. You can go ahead and read it. And this is a real data set. Um, this, but uh, this is actually a kind of a slightly wacky from a kind of um, SPSS format. I think this is a pure Excel data analysis. Um, it's from a, uh, a kind of interesting uh, paper by uh, a guy named S.L. Sklar from 2012. Um, and the paradigm was, can you do arithmetic problems, simple addition and subtraction, unconsciously? Um, so these things will flash up while lots of other stuff was flashing in the other eye to keep you from seeing it consciously. And then these arithmetic problems were supposed to prime their result. So this would be a, um, uh, a uh, you know, 1 plus uh, 2 plus 5 prime. And so you're supposed to see this unconsciously while lots of stuff is flashing. Um, and then the target, you're going to be asked to read out the digit 9. And the idea is if the target is consistent with the prime on a congruent trial, then you're going to be faster. And astonishingly, they found that this was the case for some trials. I think it was um, only subtraction. And uh, anyway, it's an interesting set of experiments, thought-provoking people are working on trying to understand what it means. Um, I was looking at the data, and uh, this is the format they came in. So we've got a prime trial is our row. The prime result was 8, the target is 9. It's not a congruent trial, it's an addition trial. The distance between the prime and the target uh, is um, minus 1. There's a counterbalance condition. And then here are the reaction times to read the target for the subjects. So the subjects are number 1, 2, through 21. So there are 21 subjects here, and they are the columns. So all of 21's data for all of the trials and experiments are given in 21, the column 21. So that's the data set. Um, your goal is to make it tidy. So um, gather it up. So that's the verb gather. Um, give it a shot. Remember, you have to imagine the data set you wish it to become and imagine what those names are. Uh, and go ahead and uh, uh, feel free to Google around. This would be uh, helpful. So um, as before, red post-its um, if you're having trouble. And I'll give you um, four minutes.
Okay, um, let's come back together. Um, so, walking around, I saw that you know this this uh, is challenging for a, a number of folks for a couple of different reasons here. So, um, this uh, I think this is a uh, kind of somewhat difficult conceptual shift to think about uh, in in kind of most of the tidyverse and most of programming. What we do is we specify arguments that already exist. So we look up those arguments in the data frame that we want, and we say, OK, I want to filter on this column that already exists. Gather is an unusual call in that it actually uh, takes arguments that don't yet exist and creates them out of the data. So in order to tidy um, a data set, um, we want to take Sklar, and we want to gather. And we have our three arguments here. Uh, and the third argument is going to be selecting the columns that we want to gather. So let me let me actually just bring down um, the Sklar data set so, I'm, so we can look at it. Okay. So um, we want to gather up a particular set of columns, which are these guys that start with one to twenty-one. Okay. So that's devastating column naming. You know, um, it's hard to pick out numeric columns, you could write a regular expression. Um, if it were me and I were just uh, kind of modifying this raw data set, I might go back and name them subject one, subject two, subject three. Then I could write starts with subject, and that would be super useful. Um, not going to uh, do that. Instead, I'm going to refer to them by name. Um, uh, I think it's column 8 to 28 uh, for now. So one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight. Let's refer to them that way. And now, again, I need to fill in these two arguments. So the first argument is going to be the thing that puts together all of these uh, uh, 
um, these column labels. So in the SGF example, that was item. They were all called, they were all like basis, housing, and so forth. Here it's subject ID. Um, and the second thing is going to be the values in those columns. So I need to think of what I want my name for that value to be. And that's reaction time in this case. Um, so uh, call it RT, something, or just RT. And now, what I get is a tidy data set where um, I have subject ID 1 on each of these primes and then their reaction time. And down here is subject ID 7 and their reaction times, and so forth and so on. So what I've done is, again, I've taken each of these columns and I've kind of appended it down at the bottom with the identifying information. Is there a more transparent way to select the columns than simply arrange over the, the column indices? Or? Yeah, good question. We, uh, um, uh, matches, um, I can never remember regular expression, um, yeah. and R. That's not it. Is that it? No, that's not it. Um, so if anybody remembers, so you could write a regular expression. I didn't do that because it brings up regular expressions, and I, now I'll be like googling regular expressions in R because I can't remember what the escape character is on. Anybody remember it? Offhand? Backslash E. Backslash E? E. D. E. D. E. D. E. D. So this just destroys me always. I, I, it just takes me a little while, so that's why I did it this way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, can you quote these? Um, um, so, so there, there's a bunch of reasons not to have um, columns named integers for kind of our reasons. So this is kind of a, this is a little bit tricky because we've been handed a bad data file that has a naming convention that I love. Um, so that's that's a kind of an extra difficulty over and above the kind of actual convention here. So let's. Um, Let's go back and tidy an easier data set as well, just as a kind of further comprehension check. So, um, so I'm going to take the iris data set, and I'm going to mutate it so it's got an iris ID number. So there's something unique for each iris, which is not something they had in the original data set, but I've added an ID. Um, and now um, I could, uh, um, you know, if I wanted to make uh, each of these measurements here uh, come out as a separate um, kind of measurement, so, so I could gather each of these measurements and I could call them, these are all measures, so I could gather measurement, uh, so measure, and then the second argument would be, right, the value in here, so what's the value in here for each of these measurements? Something like centimeters or inches or something like this, right? And now I have to, my, my third argument is going to be all of the um, columns that I want. So here it would be, you know, I could say it uh, starts with safe all. I think I could probably say it starts with safe all or starts with pedal. Or I could probably even just list them out. No, I can't. So now I've got the measurement of iris ID1 in the cytosin species. Its measurement for sapal length is 5.1 centimeters. So I've uh, kind of gathered this up um, again by sort of doing the same operation. Again, I've done the same operation, which is the first argument is the name of all these columns. They're all measurements. And the second argument is the thing that is in all these columns, which is all the number of centimeters. So um, in all of these cases, I'm, um, I'm providing to, to uh, the gather call 
um, the name of these two new variables I want in my tidy data set, and then the columns that I want eliminated in favor of those uh, two new variables. Should I gather one more thing, or should we move on? If you want to gather one more thing, raise your hand. No? Okay, we'll move on. Good. So, um, my general feeling about uh, gather and spread is that they are just kind of a, a little bit of a conceptual hurdle. You have to kind of play with them a bunch of times. Um, the first probably 10 or 20 times I used gather or um, reshape with it, its predecessors, which worked the same way, I just had to look them up um, and think about it a little bit and study a couple of examples. So, I'll just go back and play with uh, the examples a bit um, to try to get a flavor for what's happening. Okay, um, so now I'm going to do uh, two things in the remaining time. The major thing that I'm going to do is show you a bigger, that is to say, medium data worked example. Uh, and then um, I'm going to show you a few bells and whistles that you could tack on, but not talk through exactly how to do that. So the medium data example that I'm going to show you um, is a site called WordBank. So WordBank is a database of children's vocabulary development that my lab curates. Um, the idea is um, people around the world are interested in how kids are learning uh, meanings of common words, and so they give parents a checklist, like, does your year and a half old kid say or understand dog? Do they say or understand cat? Do they say or understand table? Do they say or understand uh, run? And so forth and so on. And these big long lists uh, then become data about which words are known by which kids. Um, so, we have um, gathered up these data from a wide variety of languages. Um, English of, of different varieties, Danish, Norwegian, Turkish, Mandarin, Spanish, Russian, Slovak, Australian, English, Swedish, Quebec, French, German, Cantonese, Italian, so forth and so on. Um, and put these into a, a uniform format, in this case a database, um, and then uh, built some R applications on top of them so that people can browse uh, and explore the database. So this particular um, R application is built in a platform called Shiny, which I'll tell you about in a moment, uh, and allows you to plot, the, for example, the productive vocabulary for kids at different ages. So um, this just gives the quantile curves for uh, different levels of vocabulary acquisition. So um, a two and a half year old in the 10th percentile is probably producing around 200 words. Uh, in the 90th percentile, they're sealing in the forms. So they're probably producing thousands of words. Uh, but um, you know, they know almost all the words on this 600 plus word questionnaire. So um, this is kind of fun because you can browse around it. You can look up a different language, like maybe you want to know about um, British Sign Language. Uh, so this is a, a, you know, um, a normative curve for British Sign Language. And you can look uh, also at um, different demographic variables and their effects. So for example, we could look at the effect of uh, gender. Um, we could even look just at the median effect of gender for Danish kids' um, productive vocabulary. So um, and what we see here is that there's a female advantage, a fairly pronounced female advantage, for vocabulary learning for Danish kids, um, which, you know, say we look at American English, Actually, if anything, even bigger. Maybe we could look at German. About the same. Our state is similar. So we can browse around and play around and maybe discover some new things about how kids learn to talk. And that's the idea of this database. So it's kind of fun. Um, critically, this is, I would call this medium data, right? It's not tiny data. Um, it's kind of uh, closer to the sort of thing that you might find uh, dealing with maybe not web scale, but, but uh, kind of naturally occurring data sets. Um, so we have data from um, 6,000 children, so 70,000 CDI administrations, and each of those administrations has 600 plus data points in it. So we're starting to talk about millions of rows. So um, how do we deal with this in the tidyverse? It turns out to um, be pretty fun and pretty easy. DeepFlyer really shines in this context because it's not appreciably slower on data of this magnitude when it's organized appropriately compared with data of the magnitude we were looking at earlier. So um, here there's a, a dependency conflict. So we actually have a, an R package called WordBanker where you can uh, go straight to the database and uh, download data. But um, instead what I'd like you to do is load the cached data um, using um, this command. So that should be commented out in your markdown. You can uncomment it and run it. Um, and that'll 
uh, that'll uh, get you in some data. So when we look at these data, again, I'm using data table here, just you could knit that and be pretty. Um, what we see is each row contains a particular summary of the data set for use in this exercise, which is um, a data ID, the age of the child, the number of words the child um, was said to understand and or produce. Um, and this is just for English um, and for the form for kind of older kids. There's also a bunch of kind of demographic stuff over there. Right. You can see what their birth order was, what their ethnicity was, and so forth. So um, this is the data set we're going to be working with. Um, this comes out of the Word Bank uh, database. And uh, we can look at this very simply using ggplot. So if we uh, define a simple aesthetic mapping where x is age and y equals the number of words you produce, and we put a point for each data point. This is just a simple scatter plot. Okay, that's a lot of data. So that's not super useful. Um, so, uh, okay, we got a lot of data. How can we fix this plot? What would be useful plotting things that we could do that might make this more reasonable? Small data, you can plot every point. Medium data, again, you have to, you have to play with the points to plot them. Can we make the point smaller? Yeah, okay, let's, um... Sort of, oh, helpful. Jitter. Jitter, yeah. Um, okay, uh... So we changed to it. Jam jitter, okay, that's starting to help. That's kind of nice. Yeah. We could try to dial in our jitter a little bit. Um, um, so right now it's generating almost the entire, uh, you know, almost the entire size of the month. So we could make it maybe um, five, and we don't want to height jitter here because that changes the actual nature of the data. Oops, that, uh, yeah, so we got these kind of discrete columns. That's kind of cool. Um, we can even um, set uh, alpha. That's transparency value, I don't know, 25. Mm. Starting to get a visual impression of the data set. We can play around a bit more and see what we get, what we get but you start to see the density, different densities of data. We have different amounts of data, like um, 24 months to your birthday, that's like a big data year because everybody does study them too, like at the second birthday. Um, so that's a, a general feel for the data set. Um, okay, so um, we can also do this, um, we can actually import our nice, nicer aesthetic. We can do this by, um, to plot that relationship between, uh, call it biological sex, gender, it's so hard to tell with a two-year-old. Um, so I've kind of go back and forth in an unhelpful way here, but the variable is called sex, because um, assumed to be biological sex that's reported by the parents. Um, so here are um, the uh, biological sex data for um, the uh, kids across different ages. And this plot is not that helpful. Um, to do better, we might need to summarize. So let's summarize. Okay, so let's get the means and standard deviations by age and sex, and um, also let's filter the missing sex data kids. So, um, this is a chance to use those dplyr verbs to, to break them out. Um, so go ahead and create this ws word and sentence underscore sex uh, data frame using dplyr. <coughs> and as before, um, red post -its.
So if you finish this exercise, um, give us a blue sticky. Uh, and if you um, are working on the filter, um, note that uh, is.na will give you the missing values. Let's come back together um, and talk a little bit about this. You know, a few people are still working on this. That's fine. Um, but let's let's talk through the um, the problem decomposition here. So, I, in order to get this data frame, um, so we are going to be um, first summarizing. So we know this is a summary data set. So we've got a summarized verb somewhere in here. Um, what other verbs do we need in here? Group by, because it's a, it's not a 
Do I even mean summary? It's a group summary. And what other uh, verbs do we need in here? Yeah. And so, in general, filter will typically come first in these kinds of chains. Um, so, uh, okay. So now we can. Um, we're going from WS to piping a filter, we're piping a group by, and then we're piping a summarize. So um, now we can begin to fill in the details of these verbs, having established kind of our action sequence. Okay, so um, let's start with the filter first. So our goal here was to filter the children who have missing data for the sex variable, and missing data here in this particular data set is coded as NA. You can scroll up and um, take a look. Um, Actually, you know, um, for HTML, the data tables are a bit better, but, but here, um, let's just view. Um, so you can see zygosity. Um, so most of these are not twins, and so we don't have zygosity, but sex is mostly represented. Um, maybe there's some data set down here that we can sort. Go down to the bottom. Okay, so there are some NAs for sex down there. Um, so how should we code this, um, this filter condition? Yes, not is NA, so exclamation is NA over sex. Yeah. So this is a very, this is a terse and uh, reasonable way to do it. Um, I think that's how I did it in the solutions below. Um, this relies on the fact that this, fil this filter uh, condition evaluates to, uh, to true. Uh, you could also say um, uh, equals equals false. Um, you could even say equal to F, um, but that's terrifying because you can write things like F T. <laughs> if, if you don't know what that means, forget it. <laughs> but um, don't write F. Write false. That's all. Um, okay, so so this now we've got a filter condition that gets rid of those um, annoying gray dots up there. It says NAs. That's useful. Okay, what do we want to group by in order to uh, get the kind of summary that we're asking for here? Yeah, so it just comes from naturally from the, uh, the way we've described the problem. So age, sex, and now the last thing that we need to do is get our uh, summary measures. So for each of these, we're going to be defining a column. Um, so uh, what columns do we want in our summary data set? Okay, production theme, and what's that going to be? Um, blue beyond the, the fourth row. Yeah, great. So we're just taking the mean over the production. Uh, so we're just summarizing by the mean. And then production SD. Same deal. So we're, so we're applying the standard deviation of the mean. Uh, so let's give this a shot. Okay, so we've assigned a variable so that nothing uh, showed up. So we... Okay, and now we have 16 month old females, the production mean, the production SD. Great. Okay, and now we can plot that. Um, we get this nice plot with means and standard deviations. Cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we could even, if we wanted, um, get all fancy and uh, add our GM jitter from above. Um, be all fancy here uh, because I am. Uh, so this is not going to work because I'm plotting WSX, but I could add a different data set. I could add WS. I could even add filter WS not is not sex. So I get only those kids with sex data, and now I could jitter their data. And um, I think my aesthetic mapping will actually even map over. Is that true? No, because I don't have to make more production. Means. So I have to set up a new aesthetic. X equals age, Y equals production, call equals sex. So, um, so now I get the um, jittered uh, 
full distribution of the data as well as the uh, standard deviation and some. So um, just to kind of hammer home the obvious, um, this call here, which is kind of a little complicated, there's a bunch of stuff going on in it, um, nevertheless critically depends on exactly the same thing that all the easier stuff we did depended on, which is that all of these data sets are uniform in the same way, namely they're tidy. So our summary data set, LUSX, is tidy and actually has a lot of the same variable names as the um, non-summary data set, as the raw data set, WS. We could actually, I bet if I, um, if I uh, make this called production, um, I could even cut out this aesthetic. I could use the same aesthetic. So it would be the summary and the um, actual data points um, use the same exact aesthetic mapping. No. So um, I've built up this kind of complex call by uh, virtue of the fact that I've got uh, these two data frames um, that have um, the same column labels and the same format, and they just happen to have different granularity of the data. One is a summary of the other. And so I can put them on top of one another. Um, this, I think, is super cool. And this is where we're really starting to get out of the territory that was easy to do in any of these other uh, ecosystems. Like, once I'm in four loop ecosystem, these kinds of plots with multiple different layers get super, super hard to make. Um, but it's very easy to layer them on when the data are in the same format. Um, so uh, this kind of compositional layering of uh, different representations of the data is really nice. Uh, and there's been a big push for this kind of uh, compositional representation of the data that showed not just the uh, summary statistics, but also the full distribution. Increasingly, as people look at uh, more heterogeneous data sets that aren't from balanced designs with kind of clear measures, like, uh, right, because this is a sort of naturally occurring data set that's the aggregation of a lot of others, it's actually useful to know that there's way more data in some bins than in others. There's some sparsity issues, there's some ceiling effects. There's lots that you can see here from this representation of the data that's not present in the, um, uh, in just seeing the lines. So, uh, I think it's a huge strength of this ecosystem. Cool. Okay, um, I'm going to skip the uh, effect size computation, um, and uh, in the interest of fishing, uh, finishing on time, um, I want to show you uh, just a quick demo of three things that are kind of the next steps for you to look into. If you get passionate about this ecosystem, if you're excited about it, here are three ways you can go to uh, try to um, kind of broaden the tool set, um, expand it into uh, doing different things. So the first thing is super easy, um, which is uh, if you're uh, reading bigger files and faster. So um, I want to note here that um, you may not have noticed, but instead of writing read.csv, um, I've been writing read underscore csv. So that's a minor tweak, um, but it actually invokes the reader package rather than the base R csv reading package. So reader package is part of the tidyverse. It reads in tibbles, which have kind of their kind of positive formatting uh, aspects. It's uh, substantially faster, um, and it has better defaults than read.csv. So um, in general, a good thing to notice is that underscores tend to mean more modern, more tidyverse R packages. Dots is more like base R. Um, why do, does the tidyverse use underscores? Well, in part, it's because um, we're kind of talking to lots of people with experience programming in Python, and dots mean something very different in Python and JavaScript and many other um, uh, languages with sort of more uh, obvious object-oriented bones than R does. So dots are super confusing for somebody like that because um, it's not like we're um, you know, taking a read object and applying .csv to it. That's totally weird. Um, so read underscore CSV is a kind of um, you know, one instance of this strategy. So I've already kind of taken you a little ways into reading uh, bigger files faster. But two ways you can uh, kind of go further in that direction. One is the dbplyr package. So dplyr is what we've been using. dbplyr does the same stuff, but helps you connect with, um, uh, with databases. Um, it got forked off of dplyr recently and is uh, super useful. It's actually the back end of the, re uh, the word banker package. Um, so if you end up working with like a tech company that has things with a database or using a kind of longitudinal study database or anything like that, that's a great uh, way to go. And the last thing I want to mention is uh, Feather. Feather package is a super recent addition to um, the R ecosystem. 
It, Feather is a fast-loading binary format that's interoperable with Python. So if you need to move data back and forth between Python and R, Feather is the way to go. Um, and it has, I think, only two calls in the library. Write Feather, data frame, file name, and read Feather, file name, and that's it. It's a binary format, so you can't look at it like CSV, but it's smaller and way faster. Um, just to show you this, here's, um, here's these words and sentences data read by um, uh, read.csv, um, which takes uh, 50 milliseconds. Um, here's read underscore CSV, which takes uh, 20 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds. Um, and here's uh, a feather version of it, which I stored in the cache, um, which takes 10 milliseconds. Let's try that again. 50, uh, 14, and that's what close to what I was getting, 2 milliseconds. So um, often in this, I see kind of 2 to 3x speed up for read CSV and a 20x speed up for read feather. So that's pretty nice. Um, 30x speed up. So, yeah, these are really nice ways where as you're moving towards slightly larger data sets, um, all you're doing is replacing one command with another command. So it's not like it's a lot of conceptual overhead. It just makes things faster because you're using more modern software. That's cool. And handing feathered files off to Python folks is a nice way to maintain um, tabular data formatting without having to go through um, a CSV reader, which has some kind of you know, questions. Okay. So that's, that's the first thing I want to mention is just um, kind of reading bigger files. Second thing I want to mention is interactive visualization. So once you're in the tidyverse like this and you're making GT plots, it's actually not a big step to start making your plots interactive and putting them on the web. Now, when you're doing experimental data analysis with a one-off experiment, that's not as interesting or useful. But when you're starting to look at larger or more naturally occurring data sets, interactivity becomes a much better tool because there are lots of different ways of looking at the data, and it can be very cumbersome to just print out every single graph you want to look at. Um, in fact, the World Bank website that I demoed to you is built using R and the uh, dplyr ecosystem and a package called Shiny. <coughs> so um, Shiny is a set of tools for making interactives in, uh, in R, and it's pretty easy. It's not trivially easy, but it should take you, you know, a half hour clicking around with um, uh, Stack Overflow to make your first Shiny app. Um, so I'm not going to tell you too much about how this works, although there's a little documentation, a little description in here. Um, the thing that I want to show you um, is how a chunk of Shiny code, this is our Shiny app code, so it's um, 24 lines of code. Um, is going to make a kind of cool app for us to explore these exact same data we're looking at. So um, first I'll show you what the result is. So this is, um, so this is a kind of um, summary plot over that words and sentences data that we're looking at there. There you go. Um, but now I can choose maternal education or birth order or ethnicity. So uh, just for kids, maternal education, we can see the depressing fact that primary educated uh, parents are reporting um, lower vocabulary growth for their kids, then followed by some secondary, um, some college, college on up. So there's clear, in this US data, there's clear um, education stratification in vocabulary. Um, so um, education tracks with socioeconomic status, so that's a kind of sad fact about American system, and then we could compare to other educational systems and so forth, um, and start doing policy research, and that would be pretty cool. <laughs> that's, you know, that's kind of what we do. Um, but uh, the thing that I want to highlight here is you're just doing the same plot as you did before. You just added one element of interactivity, which is this split variable. And um, actually, what we've done here in the Shiny app is we set up a user interface. Um, where we set up that split variable, we set up the choices for the um, uh, user to select and plot the plot. So that's the user interface or UI for the, uh, the Shiny app. And then in the server component, which is the second component, um, we simply do that grouping and summarization and then make our ggplot. So there's a little bit of extra wrapper stuff that has to do with specifying the grouping variable. Um, and there's a little description of that in the, um, the text of my tutorial. Um, but essentially, moving from the static plot to the interactive plot involves plugging in the um, selector to your user interface and then plugging in 
the data processing code that you already have to your server, and then you have the back end and the front end of your interactive visualization. And that entire word bank website that I showed you uh, is essentially just a bunch of those shiny apps. All of this is written in shiny. Um, this is just a kind of fancier way of specifying the selectors, and this is just a little ggplot that's being generated by the same dplyr to ggplot uh, code ecosystem that you've just learned. So, so um, there's a little bit of um, poking around uh, that you can do to see what the possibilities are here, but they're really pretty impressively broad. Um, and I encourage you to look at the shiny gallery, which is a gallery of interactive, some of them quite simple, all with open code hosted by uh, our student. Um, and the last thing I want to talk to you about is function application. Um, so uh, and this uh, hooks up and with um, Henrik Singman's tutorial a little bit later. Um, so what I've tried to highlight throughout is a perspective on DeepFlyer and, uh, and the tidyverse as being about applying functions. So uh, applying functions in a chain to process data frames. And from that perspective, summarize is just a verb that helps you apply functions to chunks of data and then bind them together. Exactly the thing that we were doing when we did all those for loops, you index it into the data frame, choose a subgroup, do a thing to it, and then bind it back together. Um, summarize, though, if you think about summarize, what summarize requires, when you summarize with the mean function and the SD function, those all require that you have a single output. Your little animal has to, have spinning out, has to be sitting out just one number. And there are lots of cases where you don't want to just spit out one number. You want to apply a function that spits out a couple numbers. Here's an obvious example, um, statistical testing. Statistical tests, you can't just spit out one number. You often want to spit out quite a few numbers, like um, the t-statistic, the degrees of freedom, the p-value, and so forth. Um, or maybe you want to uh, run a linear regression, and you want the slope and the intercept. Um, so it turns out there are ways to do this within the tidyverse as well. They require verbs beyond summarize. Um, so I'll show you a, a toy example, again with these word bank data from words and sentences. Um, so again, we're going to filter by uh, sex, so that's exactly the code you wrote. Then we're going to group by sex. And then what we're going to do is we're going to fit a linear model of production by age. Um, and I'm going to make use of a package called uh, broom, which uh, gives you a function called tidy, which cleans up the output of a linear model. So what this little pipe chain does is, I think, pretty revolutionary in terms of the amount of code it saves. Um, it runs a linear model on subsets of your data. So um, maybe if you're a psycholinguist, you want to run a regression on each individual subject to regress out nuisance variables, like the length of words or the time to take people to hit keys. Um, or maybe you want, you're doing longitudinal data analysis and you want to compute a separate growth curve for each participant and look at their parameters. Um, there are lots of applications where you want to run a model on every single subgroup and then stick things back together. And that's function application. So um, this little uh, ecosystem here will allow us to apply a function to every single subgroup. Okay. So um, returning to the goals of this tutorial and wrapping up, um, what I want to show you is what tidy data is and why it is a, an awesome format, why it's the format that you should adopt for your small and medium data needs. Um, hopefully I showed you that. Um, it's a super simple format um, and it enables this whole ecosystem of function application and piping, which gives you fairly readable chains of verbs, chains of actions that you do to those data that return other easily readable data sets. Um, now, getting to tidy data can be complicated. There are some programmatic tools to help you, like gathering and spreading, um, like a number of the other functions that are provided by the tidier package. Um, but uh, as many data scientists will tell you, 90% um, of the work is in tidying the data. It's in cleaning up the data. And the reason they will tell you that, I believe, is because once you get the data to the right format, all of this stuff is actually really easy. And it's become easy because of this ecosystem uh, and, and other related ecosystems. So um, I hope this convinces you to move towards tidy data and start to master these primitives because it'll open up uh, a whole kind of coherent framework for your data analyses for you guys. Uh, and also, um, it allows you to reuse a lot more of your data analysis ecosystem across projects because you're doing the same chains of verbs uh, across project after project 
And every time you run an experiment, you're taking the mean across subjects and conditions, and then taking the grand mean, and then plotting it. And that stuff is short and easily reusable across projects, so you uh, decrease your chances of making errors in these kinds of uh, uh, data analysis chains, which is, in the end, why I migrated, coming back to this story about the erratum and the errors that I've made, why I've migrated further and further in this direction of kind of literate programming using semantically decomposed, uh, easy to understand chains of operations. All right, thanks very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the workshop, and uh, Alex has a few announcements for you to finish up. So uh, that's the end of our program for day one. I hope you all all learned something and enjoyed it. Um, so there's going to be another workshop every day that we're here that's coming immediately after us. So everything that you all have, um, we'll need to quickly pack up at the end, at the end of this. Uh, please take and save your red and blue stickies. Um, we will have more if you lose them or whatever, but if we can save some trees, that would be great. So again, um, information about our social event at Jupiter um, is available in the social channel um, on Slack. If you have questions or anything, feel free to reach out. There's a link and, uh, to the directions and to um, Jupiter's website. So um, if you can stick around and maybe help us rearrange the room in case uh, some folks need Oh, never mind. Perfect. Y'all have already done exactly what you need to do. Okay. Um, thank y'all, and see you tomorrow again at 9 a.m. if you're not able to make it tonight for the social event. Oh, yeah. Great. Thank you. Great job. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yes. When we stopped it, we stopped the event, right? It's just completely yeah, stopped. exactly.